Hey, Outlaw Nation fans, and welcome to another episode of The Deep Cut here on the Outlaw Nation. I'm incredibly excited to welcome a director, producer, writer, storyboard artist, and sometime actor here in the world of animation. He has a new film that he is dropping now on VOD from Warner Brothers. It is called Scoob. It is so, I'm so excited to talk to this gentleman. That is Tony Cervone. You've seen his work. I hope I'm saying that right. He'll correct me when he comes on. But you've seen his work in Animaniacs, Duck Dodgers, Pinky and the Brain, Tom and Jerry, the Tom and Jerry Tales, the Looney Tunes show that came out in 2011. He was the director of animation for the for Space Jam, which we're going to talk about, considering the last dance is happening all over the place now. Uh, and of course, he was the he's the director now of this new film, as I mentioned, Scoob, which is an updated approach to a classic Hanna-Barbera cartoon that is amongst one of my favorites. And I'm sure for most of you all, it's one of your favorites. Favorite Scooby Doo uh, and the Mr. Machine Gang. Let's bring them on now. Tony Cervone, how are you, man? Am I saying the last name right? How are you? It's it's, uh, it's Cervone, but that's Cervone. But yeah, that's. Sir, sir, I will also answer to Cervone. But okay, uh, Cervone is totally fine. <laughs> uh, how are you, man? How you doing? You're in your bunker yourself. Uh, you got the playoff beard going on. Talk to me. Yeah, that's how. right. <laughs> Um, I'm good. I'm good. I'm excited and nervous and all those things because the the big movie comes out. Be available tomorrow and forever. Yeah. Know, so, well, it's, it's coming. by the time this comes out, it'll already be available. Oh, okay. So, because we're dropping this on Monday, according to what I was told from Warner Brothers. My question to you, right off the bat, you've done so many things. You've had a storied history and career. I mean, going back to Animaniacs when it first was up with Steven Spielberg, and you worked on so many projects. Would you say that this is your biggest project that you've ever undertaken? It took six years. You're adapting or updating a classic cartoon like this that people get really touchy about. Like, what, what was this? Is this your biggest project? Is I guess yeah, my first question. Yeah, I would say this is it. I mean, I, I think I've been lucky enough to be on a on a on some big things, mm -hmm. but this is really important. You know, this is the first all animated Scooby Doo movie, and yeah. uh, and. It was quite a challenge, but uh, but a great challenge and a lot of fun. When you were when you were starting the process, uh, did you lobby to become the director on this? How did you come to be the director on this project? Um, I didn't. I uh, there was a script mm -hmm. uh, that by Matt Lieberman and Chris Defari at the time asked uh, my wife Allison Abadi and I to read the script, and mm -hmm. I had already done some Scooby Doo stuff by by that yes. point. Right. But both of us really liked it. So we joined the movie um, as director and producer. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then she's gone on to actually uh, be the, she's actually running the the, the Warner Brothers feature animation WAG wow. unit. So she's, okay. but also a producer. So she's, she wound up even busier, busier than I was. <laughs> but, uh, but what I really loved about the script and loved about this story was, even though it's a, a Hanna-Barbera universe, it was really centering on Scooby and Shaggy and their mm -hmm. friendship and their relationship and right. took these two characters that are usually like the comic relief in their show and move them into the spotlight. Like yeah. it is their, a big movie with a lot of characters, but they're really the stars. This is really their story. Yeah, and it's just it's such a great point you bring up here because I watched the movie this morning. You know, as I used to watch Scooby Doo cartoons in the morning before school, having my cereal, I literally went back in time to watch this because I wanted to be in the right mood to appreciate it. And I had a bit of skepticism initially because I'm like, well, is this going to work? Is it going to be cheesy? Are they going to go for the easy jokes, or is this actually going to be a um, I don't know what unique update that that is artistic and for lack of a better term. And as I was watching it, I found myself just having a big, stupid grin on my face and appreciating the work, appreciating the music choices, the look of it, the animation, the direction. And yes, the heart of these two characters who have usually been kind of dismissed or played for comedy relief. But to see them see their beginning and then see their connection and their heart. I mean, I think that was really the number one thing as I was watching it was enjoying the connection between Scooby and Shaggy. I mean, as 
as much as we love the jokes and the and the action and the mystery and uh, the scale and scope of this movie, the right. thing the thing really honestly we sweated the most was these two guys. Yeah, you know, Scooby and Shaggy, their friendship, their relationship. The audience already loves them. Our goal was to make you love them even more by the end of this movie. Mm -hmm. And and I I really feel like we go deeper with them emotionally than anyone expects and yeah. and I don't know I just love I love them you know well it's a very real story of like well what happens when one person and I don't want to give away too much obviously because we want people to enjoy it and download it but what happens when one person kind of goes farther than the other person how does that affect the friendship I yeah mean, you talk about this your wife being a producer now she jumped yeah. on to be, that, and he, you know it's that kind of thing i know like, i, I do, feel i feel it? a little like shaggy right now <laughs> <laughs> um but i do think it's a it's an important story for everyone for mm -hmm. kids and and their parents like friendship it friendship endures how yeah. does it endure right you know because yeah. life is full of changes you're a little kid, you have your best friend, you wind up in two different classes, or you wind up in two different schools, or one moves, and then later one moves away, or someone gets married, or then their families, everything, jobs pull you in different directions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I've had friends I made when I was five years old, and I don't live, we don't live in this, you know, and yeah. also like that distance, and right now, it's I, I don't right now there's a bunch of people separated from their friends like yep. we're physically separated from each other and yeah kids aren't used to this and what does that mean what does that mean right. to friendship what is friendship based on and i think right. this movie has something to say about it so i think it's timely uh, absolutely i do think it's timely as well i mean i wouldn't be surprised that people down the families download this uh and their kids immediately call their friends or, or yeah. even the parents because yeah. there's yeah. a lot yeah. there's a lot here for parents and adults to enjoy because yes we can all act like we're mature we've grown up but cartoons animated uh, uh, series they have a way of touching us you know and, and ripping through all that and getting to our inner child uh because a lot of us grew up watching these things and they're yeah they, they're our first lessons about life and about it, friendship is from I, these cartoons. Absolutely. That's one of the animation strong points is mm. like it goes right in, right? It goes right, it goes right to your heart. And yeah. and I'll and for comedy and for character, like who everyone has their characters they grew up with, and to them, they're more than things on a screen, they're friends. Right. And we have to be respectful to that. Yeah. Um, you only spend a few amount. I think you spent enough time in the prequel area of this relationship. Was that the most important area of the movie that you all wanted to focus on to get that right? To so so it like because everything stems yeah. from that relationship, right? Yeah, that meeting, that first meet. You know, mm -hmm. we get to see the moment when Scooby met Shaggy. What yeah. was going on and what was at stake and. I think that was very, that's a scene we worked on many, many times and tried different iterations of. And, mm -hmm. and also it was important to me um, that the movie has a real sense of place. So it felt, mm -hmm. it felt kind of real. And, and, and I grew up outside of Chicago, but I always felt that Scooby-Doo took place in Southern California. And, <laughs> and I'm like, we're going to be here. We're going to, I want to feel like I could walk yeah. down that boardwalk or down that street. I wanted it to feel real, like in, right. in, in a, but in a stylized cartoon way. Right. And, and listen, the, the, the Scooby-Doo series, you know, is an interesting series because it, it originated in 1969. And you've talked about some other, other interviews with the Robert Kennedy assassination influencing, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's influencing these cartoons to be a little more uh, friendly, a little more fun, a little more playful. Uh, but you do have a combo of what is supposed to be the head cheerleader, the head uh, mm -hmm. quarterback, the nerd, and then you have the stoner, the dropout, or you right. know that kind of, with Shaggy, and then you of course have Scooby. So uh, it's so funny to see this thing being updated to now, where it's actually Shaggy who's the cool one, yeah. and everyone else is kind of a little bit different well, now. It's so funny I, to see the change. It, it doesn't mean them less it, cool. Yeah. No, it's like that. Remember the movie Twenty One Jump Street, right? Oh yeah, of how, how that how that flipped who was cool yeah. in the past and who's right. cool now, like. With the yeah, two backpack straps, yeah, right, yeah, 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 yeah. The <laughs> single strap, right. And, uh, right, but but that's it's a little bit like that, like, but I think I think these characters are still relevant because 
like the breakfast club we still got the nerd and the jock and the yeah. and the and the and the, and the pretty girl and the and the and the wasteoid you know right. so right um it's still relevant there's still that's one of the reasons i think we still love them yeah well, I mean, and, and the update, I, I got to tell you, I really enjoyed this thing. Just absolutely enjoyed it. I love the update because, I mean, you can update this thing and take the easy way out, right? You can comment on the characters in a kind of smirky, snarky way, which I've seen other animated things yeah. do when they try to update. But yours doesn't do that. There's a lot of love for these characters throughout the movie. And I think that helps us even when you adjust them a little bit, like Fred being in love with the van, you know, uh, <laughs> Daphne with what she's doing with the, I mean, just from the beginning, when we see them as kids, you're laying the groundwork. That's a wonder yeah. woman. Yeah. That's topical. Yeah. That's Ruth Bader Ginsburg. That's topical. Like yeah. all of it just, works and that's really the well. knight in shining armor. Yeah, knight shining armor Fred right? thinks he is, you know, like, <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> um, no, for sure. I mean, there, we, we try to do both things. We try to mm -hmm. honor, the past and try to honor the expectations of the fan because if you don't give them what they want and what they paid for right that's irresponsible mm -hmm. um but also we have to do something new or we we got to do both at the same time and and not at the expense of the other you know right and right. i think we did a pretty good job of, of the with that in the movie yeah absolutely i agree with that completely when you look at the movie too uh, what struck me also is like this is actually a um, a layered story. This isn't a simple uh, villain swir you know, twirling the mind. There's more involved here than you would think. There's some educational stuff to discover about ancient Egypt. Like, there's a <laughs> lot thrown in here that I thought, you know, and Scooby-Doo in the past subtly throws these things in there every once in a mm -hmm. while in these episodes. So I love that you honored that by making that a really integral part of the plot. Yeah, we actually had talked to scholars, uh, mm. uh, ancient Greece scholars, just to get things right, like, there's some prophecies and things that are, you know, and make sure that they were written correctly in the way they right. would have actually been. I mean, I, I think our uh, our Acropolis looks a little bit more like Las Vegas than <laughs> probably it really did, but that's okay. It's a it's a it's a movie. It's timely. It's timely. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but everything like is colorful and fun. Like yeah. It's Scooby Doo. There's some scares. There's some things in there, you know. Like it's it, but nothing I think is gonna. Nothing. It's always done in fun and done in a colorful, cool way. Yeah, and you've got an incredible cast here because we'll, we'll we'll swing back to what I another thing I want to talk about. We should definitely mention the cast here. Will Forte is the voice of Shaggy. Zach Efron, the voice of Fred. Gina Rodriguez. You know, as a Latino, I'm incredibly happy to see her in this as Velma. Amanda Seyfried is Daphne, and then Frank Welker, of course, uh, yeah. reprising the role of Scooby, which he's done for the last two or three decades now. Um, incredible uh, stuff. And you have Jason Isaacs involved in this. You've got Simon Cowell making an appearance. You've got a number of people involved yeah. in this. What was it like? for? Like, Were you there in the sessions working? I I've done voiceover before. Sometimes the director is there. Sometimes it's it's a, a you know it's a, a, it's a, a animation director who's there or a voice director who's there. Were you there for every one of these sessions yeah. with these actors to yeah, have their performance? performance okay mm -hmm. yeah that, we i really direct i was there with the actors on every session and and really worked with them because you know we wanted to make sure this is a different universe i feel mm -hmm. like this is a hanna barbera cinematic universe and it's right. different it's different than the normal scooby-doo universe and we knew we were going to change the cast and and we did it for that reason we wanted mm -hmm. this to be its own thing um and we, but we didn't want anyone to just kind of mimic the past. I mean, right. we have a great leg up because Frank, well, we have Frank Welker. Of course. Right? He is the cornerstone. He is the anchor. He is the, the house upon which Scooby Doo is built right now. <laughs> so that I think gave us some liberty a little bit of going, okay, we know Fred is, but Zach, you're an amazing, talented guy. How do you want to bend this a little bit? How do you want to bring Zach into it? And you know, same yeah. thing, absolutely the same thing with Will. Like Will has more lines than anybody. This yeah. is it really is Shaggy does the heavy lifting, you mm -hmm. know. So how much of that is, you know, there's hints of all the Shaggies in there, but really it's Will and yeah. and it's Will's heart and it's Will's emotion that I think elevates that character in this movie, this version of Shaggy, you know? Yeah. It's incredible to see how many of these SNL alums have come out and like 
really established themselves. Because I remember in the past, it, that rarely ever happened, uh, you know, for the most part. But now you've got entire casts that oh, are still yeah. working and coming out and doing. I mean, like, Bill, we just ripped through Bill Hader and Barry. Oh, we watched yeah. the entire two seasons. And Forte with Last Man on Earth and all the stuff that he's done. It's incredible to see uh, his work here as a voiceover artist. And then as if that isn't enough, you throw in Mark Wahlberg. This yeah, is its yeah. first voiceover I know. job. <laughs> and I couldn't believe that, like, because he seemed he is such a natural. Yeah. That even I didn't know that until we met, and then he's oh, like, wow. "Yeah, I've never done this before," and I was like, "Really?" And he's like, "Nope." And then I started thinking, and I'm like, "Oh yeah, that's right." <laughs> it, that seems that doesn't even make it. It seemed I was shocked because yeah. he has such a great voice to animate to, and yeah. uh, and and such a great delivery and such great timing and. Mm -hmm. um, all of the characters, because it, we don't just do this in a weekend, you know, it takes two, yeah. it takes like a year or two to record these voices. Mm -hmm. And in that time, there is still some growing and changing going on. So absolutely, once the cast was in place, we started kind of writing and crafting the characters for to them be, yeah. in a good way. But definitely Brian came to life when Mark got involved. Yeah, right. I mean, I, yeah. I really enjoy his performance. And you do, you know what's great is Blue, um, uh, Falcon was always, is a Blue Falcon, right? Blue Falcon was always yeah. like supposed to be a Batman spinoff or knockoff. Uh, yeah. But you really, in the design of it, you really make, like, oh, make yeah, it clear yeah. with the yeah. black mask and the sure. black cape. And I'm okay, they're letting you know for real. Yeah. They understand the history of this character, which but I appreciate it. We have the original Blue Falcon kind of in the movie. Yes. Like he's, yeah. he, so. We still have, you know, that character is represented, but mm -hmm. we wanted to kind of change the costume and, and come up with a, a, a slightly, you know, a, a kind of a different, more movie kind of superhero costume that felt yeah. like it came from a movie. Um, right. And so it was cool doing that. And yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of Bruce Tim in that character, you know, mm -hmm. that's, and also a lot of, we looked at a lot of the old Fleischer Superman cartoons, like from the forties. Oh yeah. Um, for, so for a lot of that physicality, right. you know, those are the things we looked at. We really, the, the, there's a lot of different animation styles in this movie. Like mm -hmm. we very purposefully went, they're almost all coming from different universes. Yeah. Sometimes all happening in the same shot. Right. Um, so it is feel a little like you've got a Bruce Tim Batman standing next to a night, you know, a cartoony these two cartoon characters what right. makes a more realistic character like it's all over the place yeah but in a yeah. i hopefully in an entertaining way oh it is very much so and it, you know it's subtle and i don't know if this is intended it makes sense right because uh, once again we don't want to go too much but there's a journey that mark Wahlberg's character is yeah. going on an emotional journey here that's related to the family uh and of course he would try to go in one direction be a little bit more overt in the design of the costume uh, than his than someone else needed to be when they yeah. were doing both. So I thought that was that's exactly what someone like that in that situation would do. And, and I enjoy that you give him an emotional journey to go through as well. So you know, yeah, you got, yeah, yeah I, I love that. Yeah, they. I mean, we have three characters that are like the human dog relationships. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, right. And they, Dynamite. And, yeah, yeah. Dynamite and Blue Falcon, Scooby, Shaggy, and Dastardly and Muttley. And mm -hmm. what is that? How do they all contrast each other? And how do they all sometimes mirror each other? Like, yeah. Um, someone said that while we were that the the three those three couples are like the history of of a relationship. Like, <laughs> like Scooby and Shaggy are in the honeymoon stage. They're still they just don't ever want to be apart. Um, right. Dynamite and Blue Falcon are maintaining they get on each other's <laughs> nerves but but they're trying to keep the train on the tracks there's still love there yeah right yeah but and dastardly and mutley are at like the end stage of a yeah. of a relationship where they're sniping at each other and <laughs> that's arguing the stances constantly. that's right. the stances yeah. right <laughs> but but still very much in a relationship yeah, yeah right like you can't so. tell them they're still in it together so yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah so that's kind of the way we thought about it a little bit with uh, when did Michael Korinsky, who of course did Spider Man into the Spider Verse uh, as a uh, production designer, when did he step into the fold here? Because this is this, I, I couldn't help but feel that way. And this was before I knew Korinsky was involved. Uh, when I was watching it this morning, I was like, 
oh, this feels like Spider-Verse. Like you've got all these different characters roaming through from the Hanna-Barbera universe. It has shades of it. And I'm like, wow, this is interesting. It was just on purpose. And then when I did research yeah. for the interview, I, Makarinsky was involved. I was so surprised by this. How early on in the process uh, was he good, involved? How much did he shape it? Three years. Like, oh, I mean, wow. for the whole product of, you know, this movie the for this version of the movie Karinsky mm -hmm. was involved for the whole time and we had an earlier art department for a, a different version and some of those designs uh that we a lot of awesome things continued but we mm -hmm. pulled them into this into this look but yeah it's definitely everything's on purpose like like i said we want like spider verse spider verse did such a great job of showing this stylized version of new york yeah that i felt like i could go there and, right. we, and we were like, no, we want the Southern California version of that, like yeah. super idealized, the the LA that exists in your in your imagination. <laughs> right. That that might not be the real Venice Beach, but uh... <laughs> first first note I made on my phone as I was watching was, I'd love to live in this Venice Beach. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what parents let their ten year old boy wander Venice Beach yeah, by right. himself, but uh, it's a movie. It's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah and that's the other thing that's interesting about the movie is it feels not in a time it just feels whenever you're watching it it's existing yeah. right um uh, because right in the 80s of course a kid could wander venice by himself in the 60s and 70s. no problem nowadays people go right insane. <laughs> but it feels but again it's an animated movie so you you give it that license but it never feels like it's taking place at a certain time, which I think is kind of the charm yeah. of the movie. You could watch it in 20 years and still enjoy the uh, that it feels current. Oh, that's great. I, I hope, so. yeah. I mean, there's something kind of like, yeah, those are kind of modern versions of their costumes, but mm -hmm. if something didn't need to change, we, we didn't change it. We actually right. had a uh, Jamie Mizrahi, who's a, a, you know, a great stylist, um, come in and help us with the costumes. Cause we were like, what would these, if you're 20 years old, yeah. what would you be wearing now? And she's like, an orange turtleneck sweater. And I'm like, <laughs> all right. <laughs> dial it up, but, dial it up. <laughs> <laughs> but also she, but also like some of those changes, even though they might be subtle, they're very, yeah. they're very feel right. So right. she was awesome and, and, and super helpful. Yeah. How how worried were you about some of the jokes that were softball shots at the early at the original series? Uh, uh, were there other jokes that were cut out? You know, it was a little too a little too nasty, a little too snarky. Like because there are a couple of jokes you make at the original series, which I think are sweet and very modern. Yeah, I don't uh, think we make fun of. We had some jokes that we actually cut that were just too like racy. You oh, know, yeah, for a okay. family audience, but. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we might be a little self-aware, but I think, I think it's clear how much we love this source material. Oh, yeah. So, so oh, yeah. we're not. We're, uh, hopefully, we didn't cross the snark, the snark line too nah. much. It feels organic and fun, and yeah. you know, like like you when you watch the the Lego Star Wars ones. I don't know if anybody's watched those. But those Lego Star oh, yeah. Wars ones Great. are brilliant because yeah. they're making fun of what they're talking about, but they're yeah. doing it from a place of ultimate respect. Yeah, and so yeah. you you're in on the joke, which is fun and it's inclusive. That, that's uh, that's Mel Brooks's the Mel Brooks law of parody, um, is, and he said that, I must have been like ten years old when I heard this, but I really I, it stuck with me, which is you need to love something to parody it. Right. Like he's like, I love westerns, so right. I made Blazing Saddles. I love Frankenstein, so I made Young for like right. I can only parody the things I love, and I'm like, that's that's a way to look at it, because otherwise I think you just get mean spirit, mean spirited, you know. Right. And, but if you love it, you can make fun of it and still be comfortable about it. Right. It almost feels like a like a friend would do. A friend yeah, who always right, knows, right. you know, how to how to get you in the right place well, and still but, be okay. And like friends, that's something we try to work joke wise in mm -hmm. with with the gang, right? The way the right. gang kind of interrupts each other or teases each other, like they're friends, and that's yeah. how friends talk. They talk over each other a little bit. They make fun of each other a little bit. They get frustrated. They get they hug each other and love each other. So. Yeah. Uh, we try to do all those, you know, we try to make it feel like real people. Yeah. And certainly that comes across the vibrancy of the animation. I have to talk about that. It is such a vibrant film. look. And I've seen, you know, animated series. My, my friend, Michael Vogel, he's done stuff for my little pony. So, so he'll like send me series. I need to watch to see what's happening in animation. Um, 
And sometimes I'll watch those and I'll feel like, oh, it feels like the characters are existing outside of the world they're being animated in. But that did not happen in this film. Sometimes it can be really vibrant, bright, the computer generated images, all that stuff is good to watch, but it's only good to watch if it feels seamless and organic. And I think you all absolutely nailed that in this movie. It feels very like lived in, uh, yet mm -hmm. new and vibrant. Uh, what, how did that come about as a look? Like, who made that decision? Well, uh, that's, you know, uh, our Chris Fowler is our lighting and uh, Jeff, all, all our, the gang at Real Effects who, mm -hmm. who, who animated the movie, they're all awesome. Um, and, and you know, the, everyone was really working at the top of their game. And a lot of that is Kerensky. Um, but a lot of that too is uh, from a very early stage, mm -hmm. I was like this, I want this to be extremely colorful. I love color. Like yeah. if you, the, the mystery incorporated is a very colorful show. The, the even the Looney Tunes show is a very colorful show. Mm -hmm. um, but th there was something where I, I love vivid color in kind of horror, like the combination of vivid color and, and, horror you know mm -hmm. what i mean like uh right. uh kind of when i was growing up i had uh, all those monster magazines you know the famous monster yeah, fangoria magazine. and all that stuff yeah, yeah, yeah and all those yeah. painted covers that you yeah. know basil go ghost did and <laughs> i loved right. frank frazetta growing up and all yeah. the the covers of all those books the conan books they were so oh, yeah they're so brightly colored and and there used to be these model kits, the Aurora model kits, that all their all their covers were just bright, yeah. psychedelic colors. So we were like, I, I want that to feel like that. I want mm -hmm. like the almost psychedelic to the point, you know, so colorful. It's it's we've left reality behind. <laughs> There's a Hall of Mirrors sequence in the movie that to get those colors, we couldn't do it with light. Right. So without giving it, you know, like it's so colorful. We had to actually just make colored versions of the characters. Oh, wow. Do you know what I mean? Like we couldn't, yeah. we couldn't make Scooby-Doo that blue just by putting him with blue light. So I was, we were just like, I guess we got to just make a blue Scooby-Doo. <laughs> <laughs> so like there's all multicolored characters. It's so, it yeah. gets trippy, if, if, trippy in a fun way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, were you distinct when you were, like, how much time did you all spend on getting the script right, getting the lines right? Because, like you said, there's three different relationships in this movie, and when those emotional beats pop up in the journey of all three of those relationships, uh, it's important to, like, note what's happening. Like, you're keeping track of what's happening with all of them. How important was it for you to keep track of that and not get lost in, like, the other stuff that get the plot points that drives you to the next plot point that drives you to the next plot point? Cra it's crazy important. And mm -hmm. we worked five years on it. Like, that type of work never stops, especially in animation where it's like, I just, you know, you come in like that. Like I said, we record these. We It, it takes years to record these things. Yeah. Um, no, we kept working on that and 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 the balance of it. Like mm -hmm. we have a lot of characters in a complicated movie. Um, yeah. But it's about Scooby and Shaggy. So if the balance started feeling off, you know, at one point we had more Hanna Barbera characters in the in the movie. Oh, that was going to be my next question. But yes, and, please. Keep, yeah. yeah, there were more. But we just as we kept going and as we kept fine tuning and and sculpting, it was like. They started distracting from our main characters, right? Um, and so some characters got benched. They make an appearance in the, yeah. the in the end credits, but uh, but at one point they were active in the movie. Yeah, I, I got a bone to pick with you because you left out Gray Babe. You left out Gray Babe. That's <laughs> long. No, come on. I know we we had a really cool Gray Babe too. We <laughs> built those. Boy, man. We have we have those characters. Like those characters were built. They're ready to go. So. Oh wow. Yeah, okay. we had a really cool Grape Ape too. Oh, so maybe in a Sabre Jaw Grape Ape and Adamant were were great. Yeah. So if oh, Adamant, that's right. Did, yeah. did you get Adamant as well? That's right. Yeah. Here's yeah. the credits. And Speed Buggy, I read somewhere you were looking at that. We talked about Speed Buggy at one point yeah. about uh, being that like the the Falcon Fury Blue Falcon's ship mm -hmm. was intelligent. And so uh, oh. we talked about maybe Speed Buggy, that voice would be the voice of the ship. As if he had bought Speed Buggy at some point and put his his brain inside the Falcon Fury. 
<laughs> I like that idea. We have a lot of theories. We go, you know, we go in real deep. So that's for the commentary track. That's for the commentary right. track. Yeah. I imagine. <laughs> uh, something else I read doing research for this interview with you, Tony, was that this uh, that the opening sequence, uh, the the original Scooby Doo animation opening sequence that you put in here when the sh when the uh, uh, the movie transitions into the older ages, which I was such a great surprise. I mean, I, you know, I was afraid that you all weren't going to touch that, leave that alone because you didn't want people to compare. But you animated this that this was late in the process. Yeah. Did you feel there was something missing, and so you guys were yes. racking your brains about it? Okay. Well, we had worked on that sequence, the that sequence that links the origin to the present day, right. a bunch of different ways. And I don't know. I I wasn't. I'm not even sure whose idea it was, but but we worked and worked, and then someone was just like, "Why don't we just do it? People yeah. want it. We want to hear the song. How are we going to get the song in the movie?" people want it how are we going to do it and we'll just do it where they're kids and then they run in one door as kids and run out as adults and <laughs> that will tell that part of the story and, and right. we're like okay this is perfect but it's late and we the models aren't built and these sets aren't built and how are we going to do it and to be honest we were like on the other side of our budget you know like oh, there's wow. production reasons um but we all had a meeting and we all like looked each other in the eye and we're like Let's just do it. Let's go for it. <laughs> <laughs> and we did. And we had like, even uh, Gabe Hill for our music supervisor, we're like, who is going to do the song? And he's like, who do you like? Do you like anyone? Like, who do you think? Can... And we're like, we wanted that kind of SoCal vibe going. Yeah. And I'm like, what about Best Coast? And, and he's like, yeah, let's give him a call. And then, I, and then I looked and I was like, they're going on tour today. <laughs> he's like, let's call right now. <laughs> And uh, they did it. Like, I think they did the song within like three, four days of talking to them. So wow. It was wow. awesome. And they were yeah. so, they were cool. And I love the way it's, it's a good encapsulation of the movie. It's the Absolutely. same, it's the same, but different. Yeah, I agree. It is the same. And it wasn't, it isn't one of those remakes that's trying to be different to be different. It's actually yeah. a remake that feels like it fits within that animated sequence that they've created for this movie. So I like I mean, that as well. It is pretty much a shot by shot recreation. There's a yeah. couple of, a couple, we changed a couple of shots, mm -hmm. uh, but but it is a that is a shot by shot recreation of right. You're using the season two, one of the shots. Yeah, from yeah, season yeah, two yeah, yeah, season yeah, one. Yeah, I noticed that as well. Yeah, I was like, yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Like, <laughs> this guy knows what he's talking yeah, about. I know. I like you know, we're like, how are we going to do this? We can't show Shaggy in a bathtub. We can't fit. We don't have time. And I'm like, in season two, he was in a garbage can. <laughs> so it's like, put him in there. <laughs> we have garbage cans. The um, same garbage can from the alley behind the bowling alley. <laughs> Put it in there. Um, <laughs> you speak about the music of all Junkie XL was involved in this oh, as well. Like, what was it like working with him? So obviously, I, I, you know, he's done stuff outside of movies. Then came in, did the I think Batman v Superman stuff yeah. uh, and for Snyder. And now, what was it like working with him on this project? I, I, it was a col a collaboration and a relationship that is possibly my one, you know, my, one of my one of my favorite things about wow. this movie was okay. that I got to meet this guy and now I, and have, and do this with him because I personally, I, I struggled. I had st stuff in my head and mm -hmm. I, I, and I struggled with it. Like they were like, what's it sound like? Like, you know, like usually you make temp scores, you know, right. along the way in the process, which are really just cut up versions of scores from other movies. Mm -hmm. Um, but there, I was like, there is no movie. And then I even tried doing it with, with songs rather right. than movie. And I'm like, I, this isn't working either. I can't express what I think this should sound like. And then I met Tom Holkenborg. We sat down and within five minutes, I could tell this guy is this guy, what's going on in his head is what's yeah. going on in my head. And, uh, and we were off to the races and he's great. Yeah. He's great. He challenged me in great creative ways, and I, I and 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 that went back and forth. And I really love the score of the movie. In fact, yeah. it sounds so much like what I always thought it was going to sound like. That when <laughs> when we were presenting it, when people started listening to it, they were like, "This is a very original score. It doesn't sound the way I thought it was going to." You know, like, mm -hmm. 
And I'm like, no, this is the way it always sounded. It's just you couldn't <laughs> hear it. <laughs> Only Tom could hear it. Uh, but it's, I really love the music in the movie. Yeah, uh, the songs you choose. I, you know, I've been doing this long enough that I, in my head, but I'm when I see a, a movie use like a song that's already been out, for example, uh, California Love, um, I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, how much did they spend on this? And then you've got all these other songs in here. Were they Warner Brothers licensed songs or connected songs? Or did you have to pay to use all those songs? We did. Wow. And that must have been something in the pitch to use. It, the, the it was. And and I, people were very cool about that. You know, like, <laughs> uh, you know, like. Uh, you saw two, you met Tupac and you're like, hey man, is it okay? <laughs> no, but that was always the song to me. Right. Uh, hmm. Things come and go. Things come and Perfect go now, over the course of five years. And I was like, yeah, that is the L.A. anthem. I want this, you know, like we need to start in L.A. What is the most what is the most L.A. song? And we tried hmm. other things. And I was like, are you going to tell me it's as good? And no one could no one could say it. You know, like yeah. we tried and if a while we thought we couldn't afford it and all that kind of stuff. But I was like, this is the song. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's like, like two or three songs where I was like, this is the song, the DJ Khaled song, the All I Do Is Win. All I Do Is Win, yeah. That was like, a this is the song. This is Brian's song. This is it. There is no other song. Right. We tried other things, and I'm like, nope, this is <laughs> Brian Falcon. <laughs> and it so works because Brian wants to say that kind of stuff right, and right. bump himself oh, yeah. up. It totally works. <laughs> I like, I like, you know, I go to a lot of LA sporting events, and I was paying really particular attention to what are the most iconic songs played in at LA sports arenas? And right. both of those songs, you're going to hear three times every yeah. game you go to. No matter what the sport is, you're going to hear those songs. Right. Um, so I thought they were good picks. Was there and a I song that you, was there a song you really wanted to use that in the end you guys just couldn't do it or couldn't get the rights for it? Is there or did every wish you, every no, song you I really got, wanted to use you got every song I really wanted That's I got. I was, like one example was uh, uh, when 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 Henry Winkler, the, his character is Keith, when he's announcing Blue Falcon and it begins like <laughs> the pre-show, the Blue Falcon pre-show. Yeah. Like, I was like, that's got to be that Alan Parsons project that the Bulls played when, the, you know, like for every game. Yeah. And they're like, okay, sure. And then we're like, hey, that, that ain't cheap. We tried other things too. And I'm like, man, ain't right. There's only like, that's, that doesn't work. Yeah. That you know, so and especially like I said, coming I grew up outside Chicago, so and yeah. and was the animation director of Space Jam. So right, right. That, that is in don't, my don't, blood. Don't underplay that. That's a big <laughs> deal. That film still endures. I mean, I was gonna ask you about it. I got two more questions, but I do want to ask you about that. Let yeah. me circle back to that. Um, how much input did the actors have in the crafting of their character? I know we talked about Will Forte, but like like Gina Rodriguez with Velma and Daphne uh, with Amanda Seafried and Fred with Zach. How much of their homework were they doing to come into the booth? Because I'll be honest with you, I have some friends who show run and sometimes celebrities get involved and they don't want to do the work. They just want to come in, do their uh, thing and run out. Um, and there are stories about that, but there are other celebrities who understand they're servicing the piece and want to work with the director. Do you get that from everybody involved yeah, in the cast? Every, everybody in the cast. Mm. Well, I mean, one thing is we're making a Scooby-Doo movie, so it's right. not like, if anything, so we didn't have like unfamiliarity where, you know, everyone was familiar. If anything, we got a little bit of, I don't know, that, that character is so iconic. Like, uh, I, I, but then it, then it became like, no, we're not, we're not, we don't want it. To, we're not imitating. We're, right. and, and don't be intimidated by the people who came before and like work it, work it. Right. And we did all over it, everyone, yeah. but a group, Ken Jong working on dynamite, like right. that's a lot of back and forth, a lot of collaboration, will a lot of collaboration and Jason Isaacs, yeah, it's dastardly. Jason yeah. Isaacs is dastardly. Like I love the original Dick Dastardly, mm -hmm. but he's a pretty one-note mustache twirling villain, you know, yeah. like not a lot of depth. Um, but then talking to Jason, who's a guy who's made a career of playing, you know, yeah, playing playing bad guys a lot, yeah, you know. Yeah. But really the most world's most interesting bad. Like, how do we make dastardly interesting? Mm -hmm. Um and a lot of back and forth, a lot of talking, and a lot of rewriting. Um, 
-hmm. Adam Zekiel, one of our executive producers, a lot of re, you know, a lot of thinking and talking and rewriting and, yeah. you know, Dasterly and Muttley are like the shadow version of, of, of Scooby and Shaggy, right? Yeah. They're, they're, they both have this bond but one is all about you know personal sacrifice and while one is all about i'll sacrifice all of you for you know like <laughs> it, yeah. per, a personal sacrifice versus let me sac let me put you on the block for this <laughs> yeah it's like it's intro it's sweet introverts versus crazy extroverts that's what it feels like when you juxtapose those yeah two it is, it is but, they, but they they're both they're both two dudes who love their dogs. Yeah, you know? it's so true. <laughs> and Dashley in a very weird way. But yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I don't want to give anything away, but that story he tells uh, about uh, 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 his dog leaving uh, through the port. I mean, that story was brilliant compared to what actually was happening. I thought that was hilarious. One of the editors started doing, like, we at one point there, well, I know we're kind of spoiler territory now, but yeah, at one point, we, at one point that was just straight you know like i'm telling oh, the story and so I'm it showing mirrored. The story. okay yeah yeah but then he kind of started messing with it we were like wow that's a brilliant idea totally and, works. Uh, totally. i was like let's do that that's dastardly. <laughs> yeah of course He's dastardly. <laughs> um, there is a lot of easter eggs in this thing as i was watching it i was like catching them left and right really enjoying it and i love the casey Kasem shout out you know i mean the original voice of shaggy having him be the the Casey's place where you're hanging out that restaurant and whatever, like how much of that did you uh, like, did you have to hold yourself back from doing? Cause I mean, you're not unfamiliar with the Scooby-Doo universe. You've done no, so many well, other things in the Scooby-Doo universe. So uh, the whole crew from every department and every capacity uh, would chip in with Easter eggs. So, <laughs> and I don't think we held back at all. I think we've got <laughs> way too, if any, if any movie has too many Easter eggs, it might be this <laughs> Because it's, I don't want him to be distracting, but it's sometimes like there are so many happening at once that, it, that yeah. I hope it's not distracting on the first viewing. Um, but <laughs> it, the, it wasn't great. Right. Oh, good. Yeah. But my my favorite of the Easter eggs are the ones that are that are about the people of Hanna Barbera, the creators, the actors, the people right. who who created this property and and who were part of that Hanna Barbera family. Mm -hmm. Um, which I was very lucky to be close to in a, uh, for a long time. Mm -hmm. Like the, that's per, that's personal, you yeah. know? So those are the ones I really like the most. Yeah. Like, yeah. like you said, Casey's creations, like I grew up as Kate with Casey as Shaggy and America's top 40. And then, you know, and then I start working at Warner brothers and all of a sudden Casey Kasem's around, you know, like, so he's both, Shaggy and a real man, a real human being to me. Right. So, uh, those, those, there's a lot of personal <laughs> things in this movie. So, yeah, I think it comes. Like that, I think it comes through, Tony. I mean, you're the director of this thing. It feels like a love letter to this, um, to this franchise, to this property, to these characters. But a yeah. love letter that is not like, oh, you know, I forget about it. it's inventive, it's new, it's interesting, it's fun, it's playful. It's a love letter, uh, understanding what made the core of this uh, work and endure for what six decades now, or coming on yeah. six decades yeah. now, uh, and doing it in a new and inventive way. I, I thought that was what came through over and over again. Is there's a lot of love here when you're watching the movie, and that settles you down. When, as I said, you walk in with a little skepticism, wondering if sure. it's going to be that good, and you, it settles you down. You go, oh, no, I'm in good hands. I'm good. I'm good to let go and just enjoy myself. And As a fan, you should be skeptical, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, yeah. you're a fan. You own yeah. it, right? You, whether you, you know, like, fans are the most skeptical people in the world. <laughs> you really are. We're the worst. <laughs> We're just like this. But, but. <laughs> That's good. And I yeah. appreciate you saying that, like, because we are also fans, right? You know, like, mm -hmm. so we can team. argue about what 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 we like or, or you know what I mean? But right. this is coming. This movie is made for families and fans. It yeah. really is like yeah. um, and fa fans who have families. So right. and I hope that I, I hope we I hope we succeeded. Well, I think that's I think you absolutely succeeded. And I think what's uh it's perfect timing. I know, look, I know the coronavirus stuff and the COVID stuff, you know, delays everything and you make adjustments. And this would have been fantastic to appreciate on a large screen and all the vibrancy and the technology now that in some theaters are just incredible to watch movies in. But 
I also think this movie is great to go to video on demand now because families need this entertainment. Family need yeah. families need this kind of like distraction and connection and um, I don't know, uh, 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 telling you the lesson again uh, of friendship, telling us again of family. You know, because they're that's just the Mr. Machine crew is a family. So yeah, there is something about Scooby Doo that I can't explain. I can't mm -hmm. explain, but it is the number one. And this, you know, like we have research data. Yeah. It's the number one thing that parents want to share with their kids and watch together. Wow. And I don't know why. And uh, but it is comfort food. Mm -hmm. Like this is a comfort food. This is a comfort. I've I've done a lot of make a wish, Scooby Doo make a wish things, and you're like, oh. you you got one wish on earth and it has something to do with Scooby Doo. That's important. That's awesome. So um and and a few of them, you know, like so. I agree with you. This is a <laughs> tough time, and people, it's tough, and we're scared, and we we're and we're insecure, and things are uncertain, and and people are losing their jobs like crazy, and yeah. that's if I mean, but if you could take a ninety minute break and sit down and laugh and see something colorful and fun and summery. Mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe it is good. You know, it's, it's. I think so. And I think it crosses the political spectrum. So you don't have to yeah, worry about yeah. that. You can yeah, just sit yeah. back no matter what yeah, state sure, you live sure. in and sure. enjoy it. You know, I think that's right. really important too. Yeah, no, we're not, we're not taking a big, you know, like, yeah, I feel like there's, there's, it's a cool thing that I think mm -hmm. everyone can enjoy. And, yeah. and really across all kinds of, all kinds of, all kinds of barriers or whatever, yeah. like it's yeah. fun. Yeah, absolutely. And I love the multicultural approach. I mean, I just yeah. I mentioned it a few minutes ago. I love Gina Rodriguez coming in. That's one of the gifts of voiceover is it doesn't matter what color you are. It matters well, what your voice sounds it like. It matters to me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it really does. It matters to me. Like um, what we started, we started talking to people really early on in the process, like in yeah. the first year, even though we knew we wouldn't record people for a long time. Right, right. And that's when I met Gina for the first time. And Gina, Gina is smart. Mm -hmm. And so Gina was like, this character is important. This character is a role model. Yeah. And I want to be that role model. Like, right. and, and she had all the right, first of all, she is there's not a lot of difference between Velma and Gina. Like they're both, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> she kind of is Velma. That's brilliant. She's brilliant and funny and, and sharp, yeah. you know, yeah. and like. And a little so, dark, like Velma yeah, is in the movie. Dark <laughs> and a little quick on her feet, you know, like so quick on her feet. Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, so that, you know, she meant it too. Like she's the first person to say it yeah. years later. We said, are you ready? I'm ready. Yeah. So, but, but being a little more diverse was really important. And yeah. we talked a lot about that. I'm like, these shows were all made in the seventies when it, everyone in the world was white, you know, like we can't, we need to diversify a little bit. And, uh, and that stuff's important. We ought to be right. It's gotta be modern. So. Yeah. And Tony, the other thing you don't, you don't put a highlight on it. Like there's one moment where she says something in Spanish and you're just like, Oh, 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 that's yeah. awesome. That's great. It's just subtle, just there. It's not a big deal. It is yeah. what it is. You move yeah. on. And I love that. I mean, as a Latino, like I said, I love that. It doesn't have to be highlighted, you know? It's just yeah. there for that moment if you catch it. And I, oh, I think cool. it's Thank you. Awesome. It wasn't something we were aware. I mean, it, mm -hmm. we were aware to try to do the right thing. You right. know what I mean? Right, right. I know we got to wrap up. So can I ask you one last question sure, about the, sure. the Space Jam stuff? Every, the, the last dance is happening. All is this a we like you're a Chicago? Were you a Chicago Bulls fan uh, growing up with with Jordan? And everything. Uh, it is. It was such a big part of my life. Wow. That, okay. A, a huge part of my life, and then pre Space Jam, right? <laughs> and then throw Space Jam on top of that. So um, I'll be honest. I haven't watched it. Oh, I what? Haven't. I haven't. I've been recording it. Oh, you're gonna do I, it all at once, aren't you? I, I'm. I. It's so emotional to me that I'm like, you know what I mean? Like, it, oh, I it. all Chicago sports fans are emotional, mm -hmm. but that is such a part of my life now that is a long time ago and all that stuff. And I feel like I need to watch it, but I need to like be ready because I have a feeling I'm gonna need like eight boxes of Kleenex to get through that documentary. Yeah, Elson's gonna come in and, you know what? No, I'm not dealing with this. 
I, sports fans are emotional. We're yes, emotional. we are. Damn right we are. But it's a, I'm, you know, I want we we covered on. I, I do a sports show on this channel as well. We cut. Co- we've been covering every two episodes, uh, reviewing it. It's it's fantastic. So you're in for a treat yeah, for sure. Right. Um, but and I there is a wait. there's a number. There is about 15 minutes in one of the episodes. It's all about Space Jam uh, and so cool. and the basketball games they were playing that they yeah. built him in a the court, court. Though. Right? Yeah, I was in those. I, I was there. What? Yeah, you were, yeah. You yes. were watching these basketball games? Yes. Yeah, I could not believe the things I was seeing. And as a basketball fan, and yeah, you know, we got a lot of celebrities in this movie, you know, big stars. Yeah. And uh, and I think I'm pretty comfortable around people. Mm-hmm. I was never super comfortable around Michael Jordan, <laughs> right? Because I was like in my head, I'm like, he's Michael Jordan. The man's barely human. You right. know, like oh. <laughs> and uh, and one day and, and I'm sorry, I won't go on too long. But no, one day, you know, I love this. <laughs> like one day we were we were sh- shoot. I was telling someone else this story recently. We were shooting. Uh, there was like one day of retakes, mm-hmm. and it was after Michael had come back and the season was going, and uh, and I was talking to him about how the season was going, and and he was telling me what he how he hoped it would go and what he was looking at and i think we got a chance here and there and maybe if this if this works out and i was like i cannot believe i'm having this conversation with this guy <laughs> wow and i still wow. i just can't believe it like yeah i when dennis robin came on the bulls we were shooting the movie and i was talking to him about that and i'm like this is history. Like for me, it's the most important stuff in the world. So right, right. I got wow. c- cartoons and and Chicago sports are the only things that keep me going. So. <laughs> I don't want. I don't want to tell you what to do. I'm wearing like, a but... Dodgers hat because I like. I like the Dodgers. <laughs> oh, I get it. I've got two of those. I'm from DC, but you got to adapt. You got to adapt. I get it. Trust me. <laughs> well. Tony, I can't tell you uh, how uh, how great this was to spend time with you, getting to know you, meeting you, and talking about this project uh, uh, because I, I, I loved it. And uh, if you are watching us right now or listening to us on the podcast network, please uh, download this, uh, order it, watch it, share it with your family. Scoob is fantastic. And it is something that brings you right back to the original series and does it in a new, inventive, and unique way that do- adults and kids we'll both enjoy and get something really uh, good out of. And it could spark nice conversations between you and, uh, and your children that you that could help them, you know, like cement friendships or repair friendships or relationships. And I think it's positive overall. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. This, this was a ton of fun. Thanks again. I appreciate it. All right, Tony, I'm going to, I'm going to let you go and finish out the show. Thank you so much. You can follow Tony at Tony Cervoni there on Instagram and Twitter. Do you do Twitter as well? I, I'm actually only on Instagram right now. Oh. Well, why not? No, is there know. anything else you want to plug or say? Ah, uh, no, I'm good. I'm good. Okay. <laughs> new thing. New things will come, though. So. Yeah, I like. Yeah, hopefully there's a sequel. I'm looking forward to a yeah, sequel. We'll see how it goes. Let's make it happen. All Thanks, right. Tony. Take care right, of yourself, man. You. Be well. Bye. All right, that was Tony Cervoni stopping by for about 50 minutes to talk to you about Scoob. He's such a. You can tell already. Such a fantastic ball of energy. Great light. A lot of fun. Really enjoyed speaking uh, with him now about it. And yeah, once again, it is out now. Uh, Video on demand. Scoob. Go and rent this thing. Go and watch this thing. Share it with your family. Have a great time uh, doing that. And, uh, you know, let me know what you think. Let me know what you think. I'll probably record a review of it as well, uh, reiterating some of my points that you hear now on the show. Uh, And let me know uh, if you enjoyed the episode as well. Remember to subscribe to the Outlaw Nation right there below. Hit that subscribe button. Get us marching towards 15,000 subscribers, marching towards 20,000 subscribers. Also, follow me at The Roca Says on Twitter and on where there it is, uh, Twitter and on Instagram. There you go. Follow me uh, there on Twitter and on Instagram as well. And of course, become be part of the Patreon. Uh, there's a lot going on here with the Patreon right, right there in the corner there. There's a lot of tiers that we've got set up, some new shows that uh, we announced uh, recently that you can be a part of as well. So go and be a part of that as well. Patreon.com slash John Roca says, go and get involved or John, sorry, John Roca, patreon.com uh, John Roca uh, there and go and get involved there and see all the multiple tiers. All right, that's it for me. Enough of the, enough of the jibber jabber go enjoy Scoob. And uh, we'll talk to you next time on another brand new episode of the deep cut. Take care, stay safe until then.